So as I say, you're very welcome uh, this afternoon to the Institute of International European Affairs. And it's uh, we're delighted to um, have organized uh, this event alongside our colleagues at the Canadian Embassy. And it's a great pleasure to have the Ambassador of Canada, Her Excellency, Ms. Nancy Smith, here uh, this afternoon with us once again um, uh, 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 in, in our presence um, here at the, at the Institute. And we have some other distinguished um, members of the uh, diplomatic corps including the Ambassador of the Kingdom of Morocco, His Excellency Dr. Lassen Marouri, which I'm sure is a dreadful mispronunciation. I do apologise for that, but you're more than welcome uh, uh, to be with us this afternoon. And I don't, on first glance, see uh, any other members of the diplomatic corps that I would be inclined, of course, to identify and mention. But if you're here, you're very welcome. We're representatives of embassies um, in Dublin, uh, more than welcome, as indeed is everybody uh, welcome uh, here. Particular our two distinguished uh, speakers, Catherine Stewart, who's Canada's ambassador for climate change, and Dr. Sinead Walsh, climate change director at our, our Department of Foreign Affairs here in Dublin, uh, sitting up here um, uh, uh, to speak to you, to address you shortly. They both have, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, a wealth of experience uh, on this uh, issue, on this agenda, and we're really looking forward to hearing from uh, both of our speakers. Um, it's a timely, you know, we always say timely, it's timely, it always seems to be timely to talk about climate and, and, and uh, this agenda, but it is particularly so as we reflect in the weeks and months after COP28 uh, um, in Dubai, where so much um, occurred, I think you'll agree, there were, uh, I think, great achievements, perhaps some disappointments, and that's the exercise that we're engaged in, at least partly today, is to do the balance sheet in a sense. And to say, look, what was achieved and what remains to be achieved. Uh, and it's often said that the COP process is exactly that, a process. That there are a series of great events every year in November, December, um, which, you know, things culminate and what's going to happen and what decisions will be made and will we get over the line and all the rest of it. As I'm sure our speakers will remind us of the uh, sometimes nail-biting exercise that COP meetings tend to be. As I know myself, there in Dubai didn't have a role, but had, had a role in some of the previous ones. And they can... Um, certainly be uh, uh, create huge expectations that perhaps not always satisfy, but I think we can we can say in relation to most of them, and certainly I think in relation to Dubai, and it's not up to me to give an assessment, but just throw it in anyway, that yes, there's much that I we can say was achieved there uh, and an agenda uh, remaining uh, for uh, uh, for the whole world really to address in the in the period ahead. So just in terms of what's going to happen in the next while, Ambassador Stewart will give her address for approximately 10 minutes or so, uh, followed by Dr. Walsh, who will also speak for about 10 minutes, and they're sharing, as I say, their thoughts and ideas that we can then have an opportunity uh, to discuss further in the Q&A session uh, with our audience. May I thank you for your indulgence um, in relation to the change of time that we had to uh, introduce kind of almost at the last minute or this morning. I'm delighted to see so many people both here in the room and I know online who've been able to stick with us for the new time of two o'clock. It was just unfortunately, it just simply couldn't uh, be avoided. But thank, thank you very much for, for that speakers and guests and everybody for indulging in that way. It's just made a slight um, impact on my situation in that I unfortunately will have to leave um, uh, um, maybe at about 2.30. And my good colleague, um, Barry Colfer, who's in the front here, Director of Research at the Institute, um, will um, be, be here, obviously, for the Q&A and uh, right through the remaining uh, remainder of the session. To remind you that the presentations and the Q&A are both uh, on the record. Um, and if you're watching online, by the way, I should say you're very welcome, uh, equally as welcome. You can join the discussion using the Q&A function uh, on Zoom, which you'll be very well familiar with uh, uh, now. Uh, you can send your questions in as they occur to you. Um, you can't do that if you're in the room because we won't let you interrupt the speakers, but you can think of your question and put your hand up at the end. But if you're online, you can pop your question in as soon as it occurs to you and it'll be there for us to go to uh, once the Q&A session uh, get started. Um, so uh, that's the introduction, the main words of introduction. Thank you again for being here. And it's my pleasure, firstly, to introduce uh, Catherine Stewart, 
Catherine Stewart was appointed as Canada's ambassador for climate change in August of 2022. Uh, she has over 25 years experience in the federal government in Canada. Um, ambassador Stewart's most recent role was as Assistant Deputy Minister of International Affairs at the Environment and Climate at, uh, at Environment and Climate Change Canada (ECCC). Uh, since 2014, she has served in senior executive roles uh, in that uh, at the ECCC, including as Canada's Chief Negotiator uh, for Climate Change, Director General of Multilateral Affairs and Climate Change, and Director General for the Americas. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you our first of our two speakers, Catherine Stewart. Excuse me. Thank you very much. And uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be here. And thank you very much for, for the invitation to come and speak about a critical topic, climate change, and uh, to speak more specifically about COP28 and what happened, have a sober reflection on, on what, what, what occurred, um, but also hopefully to talk about what's ahead. We have a lot of work to do. We're in a crisis situation and, uh, and happy to share with you what Canada is doing to address climate change, but talk a little bit more on what, what we all need to be doing. Uh, I'm really delighted to be joined with, uh, with Sinead Walsh. Um, I truly admire the work that she's been doing uh, on climate change and she was a lead on the transitional committee to create the loss and damage fund, which we stood up at COP28, a very key piece of I, what I consider to be the success of COP28. So I just want to thank Sinead for all of her uh, for all of her support on that transitional committee um, and and uh, support in the negotiation process. I know you were in those trenches very late in the early morning hours and and wanted to to tip my hat to you. So um, COP28 for Canada uh, was a very critical moment. Um, we go to COPs typically with a very inclusive and diverse delegation. We had almost 700 Canadians registered on our delegation. Our uh, delegation included youth representatives, Indigenous representatives, business, environmental NGOs, members of parliament, senators, uh, labor groups and uh, provinces and territories, et cetera. Um, and, and we feel it's very important to go uh, as, a, as an inclusive delegation because we feel very strongly that everybody needs to be part of the solution. So, uh, so we were there in, in full force and um, also there with a, with a negotiating team um, to try to get a positive outcome. We had this year the global stock take as mandated by the Paris Agreement to have a look on how we're doing collectively in meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. And no surprise to any of us here, we obviously are not where we need to be to get to keep the temperature goals within reach, to keep temperatures within 1.5 degrees of global warming. Um, and we need to be supporting developing countries more we need to be building more resilient societies. We know we are not doing enough. But the global stock take also enabled us to look back and reflect on where we've come. And it's important to be able to do this and to acknowledge where we would be if we didn't have the Paris Agreement. And we would be looking at a trajectory of global warming that is much higher than what we're looking at today if it weren't for the Paris Agreement. So it was this wonderful opportunity to look back but to look forward and to look in looking forward, we were able to come to an agreement on what we need to do to keep 1.5 degrees alive, to build more resilient societies, to support developing countries. And one of the big pieces, uh, one of the big outcomes was work on energy transition. And uh, we all agreed that we need to be um, looking to uh, contribute to the global goals, global ambition on energy transition, which includes tripling of renewable energy, promoting energy efficiency, continuing to work on the phasing out of coal, um, also transitioning away from fossil fuels, uh, which I'm sure is something you've heard as one of the big headliners coming out of COP28. We also agreed on building more resilient societies and a very flexible and country-driven approach to adaptation. 
And, um, and then we also had a good conversation on climate finance and our commitment to, to developing countries. Um, and just to highlight a, cup, a couple of things within, within that, um, we have made a commitment in 2009 in Copenhagen at a COP to mobilize $100 billion to support developing countries in their efforts to address climate change, $100 billion per year. And we made that commitment to, to see to it that we would have that 100 billion mobilized by 2020 and every year going forward to 2025. We weren't successful in that, but we have been Canada and Germany joined forces together to create a, a report on how we are doing on meeting the 100 billion. And over the past three years, using the OECD as kind of a very neutral, independent uh, researcher, we are confident now that we're going to hit the $100 billion goal by 2020, very likely in 2020. So we were able to do a lot of work um, to get agreement that we will likely meet the $100 billion goal in 2020 with commitments to continue to move that forward. That we felt was very important to acknowledge what, what has been done, but also to acknowledge what more we need to do. So we're working on this new collective quantified goal and we were able to also set out the modalities for how we're going to be negotiating what that new collective quantified goal is gonna look like for the future, the post 2025 finance. And for Canada, we certainly want to make sure we are, you know, mobilizing the trillions that we actually need to, uh, to get to where we need to be and uh, looking at all possible sources. So that's gonna be an interesting part of the negotiations going, going forward. And um, so those, those are kind of two aspects of climate finance, which I felt were really important outcomes here. Um, and then in terms of, of what we didn't get, um, we really wanted to see a commitment to phase out coal for, for, for power. And we, we, again, maintained language that we got back in Glasgow at COP26 on the, um, the, the need to phase out coal. We, we wanted to see phase, sorry, phase down. We wanted to see that phase out, thank you. And uh, we also wanted to see a, a, an acknowledgement of a peaking of emissions, emissions by 2035. We didn't see that or 2025, um, but we didn't see that. And then also we wanted to see a more in-depth conversation on sources of finance. Um, and not to get too technical, but the traditional donors were put on a list back at the establishment of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992. And those are the traditional donors that are still considered the donors today. The world has changed a lot. And so we feel it's important that we're looking at all sources uh, and not just the tra traditional donors and have that conversation on how we can mobilize and better leverage funds to support the financing that we really need. So those were three areas that we wanted to see more ambition on, but I think, I think overall the outcome was quite positive. Um, we did establish this loss and damage fund that I mentioned earlier, which was, was really good. We didn't get into a huge debate over the agenda at the beginning too, it was concluded quite quickly. And then we had a good outcome on the global stock take where we've made some commitments on how to move forward and how to inform our next nationally determined contributions, which we need to be bringing forward by 2025. So I'll leave it there um, and happy to engage in question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there's so much to uh, consider there. And thank you for just getting that discussion going on the balance sheet, as it were, um, um, from, from the COP28. Um, when I ran in to briefly into Sinead Walsh in Dubai, it was about nine o'clock in the evening. And for most of the people who were in the company, it was the end of their day. It certainly was the end of my day, but it, 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 it emerged that it was not the end of Sinead's day. Um, and I think she knew it at the time, but we, we, we were, um, th there was so much work being done by Sinead and by her team, by DFA, by all of the uh, negotiators were there, by Minister Ryan, it should be said, um, leading the, t the Irish team there, that I think we're, you know, in hu really very much in, your, in, in, in the debt, as our, you know, as the community here in Ireland, to um, Sinead Walsh and to her team for the incredible work 
um, that was done and was certainly that I saw being done at, from, from obviously from a distance um, in Dubai and the incredible amount of uh, work that's done by so many civil servants who often are in the nature of things unsung heroes of this process. And there's none more than uh, uh, our next speaker, Sinead Walsh, who's climate director in the Department of Foreign Affairs. And prior to this, she served as EU ambassador to South Sudan. Um, Dr. Walsh has worked for DFA since 2009, um, previously was ambassador uh, to Sierra Leone and to Liberia, was the head of Irish aid in, uh, the, in those two countries. Uh, uh, as well, if I have that correct. Before joining DFA, Sinead spent 10 years working in the NGO sector as co-author of a terrific book, Getting to Zero, A Doctor and a Diplomat uh, um, on the Ebola Frontline. So we're just so delighted to have you, Sinead, this afternoon, and the floor is yours to do Thanks. some introductory remarks. Thanks so much, Alex. I will, I'll try not to, to go over uh, time because I, I think... People here can see me anytime, but I think Catherine is is uh, is the star of of the show. Um, and uh, I was just thinking last night when we found out about your flight. You know, when I when I first started this job in twenty twenty, like I used to think it was remarkable before a climate meeting. You know, you'd have like a hurricane in Vanuatu or something like that, or you'd have floods in Pakistan. And actually, now you don't even really remark on that anymore because before every climate meeting, there's some there's some sort of unexpected sort of uh, destructive climate event somewhere and uh, you don't even make those observations. I was just thinking last night, we no longer say like, oh, isn't that interesting that you're here for a climate talk and you got delayed, you know, because we're just so used to it. And I think that's a real reflection of, of where we are. And, and, and obviously after the hottest, the hottest year on 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 record. Um, so it's, it's as, as you say, Catherine, we've, we've a huge amount of, of work to do. Um, I mean, I, I think the first thing I wanted to say, Alex, and, and, and you certainly have a perspective on, on this, is that, you know, this was Ireland's largest and I would say probably deepest engagement ever in a COP. And I'm kind of saying that every year uh, because, because it is, and, and, and you, I think, had, had experience as, as minister when it was much a much tighter, a tighter team, um, but uh, it, it's really gone up the government agenda, which is obviously great uh, for 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 people like like me. And and we had we had the Taoiseach and the Tánaiste, you know, three other ministers and a huge a huge delegation, which is which is coordinated. And as you say, a lot of very hard work done behind the scenes uh, by the Department of Environment, a huge amount of logistics. Uh, and and all of that. Um, and I think um, you know, Minister Ryan being at at a COP for pretty much two weeks uh, is is very unusual and uh, got, got me a lot of sympathy every time I was telling my colleagues, I'm like, two weeks, you know, because if your minister comes for a week, everybody, you know, thinks, oh, you poor thing, you know, and I was like, my minister's here for two weeks. That was my excuse for everything. I was like, I haven't sent you that, my minister's here for two weeks. Um, but, but I think, you know, and we got great support, um, you know, Catherine, from yourself and your minister, because Minister Ryan, as I'll, I'll come to in, in a minute, was was very engaged on the climate finance uh, agenda, which which Canada was was co facilitating. Um, so so it's it it was a huge it was a huge Irish um, kind of a, a collective um, effort, and I think I would agree really, and and I won't repeat uh, what Catherine said uh, about the outcome. You know, I I remember thinking at the time, you know, you you could say two things about the COP outcome, uh, both of which would be true. You could say. This is the best COP outcome in 30 years. Um, you know, this is this is groundbreaking uh, in terms of you know this this language about transitioning away from fossil fuel. You could also say this COP outcome is radically insufficient for the climate crisis, and both of those things are 100 percent true. <laughs> so it really just depends on what side of the bed you wake up on um, in in the morning. But but I think what we can say without a doubt is that given given the very difficult time we are living through um, and, and the very fractured geopolitical environment that we have, you know, I think it can give us uh, some faith in, in multilateralism more broadly, not, not even just on, on, on the climate side. Um, and I think, uh, you know, as Catherine has already outlined, I think that, you know, there, you know that, that is good COP language on mitigation. Um, are there loopholes? Uh, absolutely, and 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 the small island states, as as colleagues will probably remember, were particularly uh, unhappy with some of those loopholes. You know, having 
mention of, of, of carbon capture and storage, having mention of transition fuels and so on. Uh, but again, it's hard to get almost 200 countries to agree on anything. So, um, so, so I, I would agree, uh, and I think we would agree that this was this was a largely positive uh, COP and, and, and a good test for this system that was put in place uh, in, in Paris, uh, as Catherine said. Um, uh, not in her official capacity, but I think uh, people will be aware that Mary Robinson had quite the impact at, at, at COP, even before she arrived. Uh, she had a very significant impact in, in the media, which, you know, some, some commentators say helped to ramp up the pressure on uh, the UAE uh, presidency. We will never know. But we do we do know that we're very proud of her <laughs> and she continues to be an absolute force of nature for for, for climate justice. Um, I think just one other thought on mitigation. Um, you know, it was great to get the tripling of renewables and the doubling of energy efficiency um, goals in there. That's something that the EU uh, had, had actually worked quite hard on for for a long time. Um, but I guess the big kind of question mark then there is around capacity and how do we actually move from you know where we are now to being able to to realize that and 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 i i just wanted to mention uh a, a, an irish uh you know real pioneer in this regard who unfortunately passed away over christmas many of you will know eddie o'connor you'll certainly know eddie o'connor alex and um you know quite the visionary in terms of you know what is needed, and and this super grid uh, initiative that that uh, he was working on, and which of course will, will continue to be worked on by by others, to have a, a European grid for for renewables, as part of that uh, you know infrastructure that's needed, because it's much easier to throw out those goals, you know, than it is to actually uh, do the work behind the scenes. So I think we'll we'll miss. We'll miss Eddie and, and, and his energy uh, a, a great deal, but I think it's it's a legacy for, for all of us to, to carry on. I know that Canada is very involved in the IEA, not to be confused, um, and, and, and our, our own uh, Minister Ryan is, is, is co-chairing the ministerial in February. I think you guys are also uh, ha have a leadership position in, in, in that, uh, as far as I remember. Uh, and I think that's that's uh, you know a body. It's it's not every country in the world, but I think it's it's a growing body. That's that's kind of one of the the pieces of the puzzle, I suppose, to help us to build that capacity. Um, but but just a, maybe a few a few thoughts um, not on mitigation, um, because I think we 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 have you know understandably focused a lot uh, on 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 the mitigation and the emissions reduction uh, of COP. But um, you know, and Catherine already talked about the loss and damage. I think that was um, uh, I mean I suppose. First of all, I'm thrilled that it's over, right? Because that transitional committee just completely took over my life uh, and, and everybody's life, including the Canadian colleagues who, who were on it um, a, a, as well. And, and it, was, it was a very difficult process, very contentious process. Uh, but I, I have to hand it to UAE. It was very clever to put that on the first day of COP. This has never been done before. When we heard that UAE were going to try and get agreement for loss and damage in the opening plenary, like even the lawyers were like, can they? You know, and they were all sort of burying, you know, going back to the, you know, the footnotes and and and, and actually uh, turns out turns out they did it. Uh, and I think, it, you know, I think one has to give credit to UAE for for an enormous amount of energy uh, that they put and resources that they put into this uh, COP, you know, definitely. And, and I'm sure we'll talk about COP29 later on in Azerbaijan. Uh it was it was definitely controversial to have, a, you know, a fossil fuel producing state as 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 a host of, of a COP. I'm not entirely sure why, since there is no virtue test to be a host of a cop, right? Uh, uh, but but it was very much always in the press uh, and so on. And I think one thing that that I certainly felt is that they really put a huge effort into into the, the, the process. I mean, and a huge amount of resources behind it. So I think they do they do deserve credit, and they made some smart strategic decisions, like putting loss and damage on first. So we had something a bit positive, a bit of solidarity, almost $800 million of pledges, including uh, 25 million from, from Ireland. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it did, it did start us off on, on a good foot. Um, but maybe a couple of points that are a little bit like, as Catherine also did, a little bit sort of thinking to the future. COP29 is, is, is 
a climate finance COP is the climate finance COP, uh, just like COP28 was really a mitigation COP and, and COP27 was, was probably a loss and damage COP in the end, since we didn't achieve anything else in COP27 very much. Um, and and I think um, I think this is this is really important, and I think it's it's w one of the areas where I think Ireland and Canada share a lot of of perspectives, um, and one of them is precisely this point about you know we just can't rely on the same traditional donors of climate finance, uh, you know public finance from the Irelands and Canadas of this world. And, and somehow tell ourselves that this is going to fill the gaps. I mean, if we just take adaptation, we don't even take mitigation, if we just take adaptation, the estimate is that we need 18 times more finance than we have, right? Tomorrow we'll need even more adaptation finance and the day after, right? You, you can just look out the window for more information. You know, in Ireland, I'm sure in Canada, um, the needs are, are, are going through the roof and we're already radically underfunded. So we just can't rely on, on the same old traditional donors. And I think one area where Minister Ryan is, is, is extremely um, engaged uh, is on this area of, of innovative sources. And, and we had an EU, uh, EU agreement on this before COP that the EU would be lobbying for essentially the fossil fuel industry to be uh, you know, uh, implicated in, in climate finance. And I think it didn't get as much, uh, I suppose, airtime, or, or you know, we didn't. We got some, some good language on innovative sources in the final uh, text from from COP twenty eight, but not as much as we would have liked. But I think we all know that the COP twenty nine is 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 the big uh, COP for for finance. Um, just to mention as well, uh, adaptation. It, it it got a few, a few kind of positives at at, at COP twenty eight. Again, not as much as we would like, but I think there's some good stuff to build on there. There is an agreement, for example. To have this ministerial dialogue and adaptation 2024 so so it's 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 not bad and and there's some there's some progress that um that you know that that we can we can kind of build on but again it comes back to this point of you know we need to support developing countries for for their absolutely massive and growing adaptation needs but also for their green transition and for those green transitions to be just because there's huge problems of, and I think we can all even see this from our own uh, country when we've been transitioning away from peat in the Midlands you know these things are very difficult people are very wedded to you know the economy and societies that have been built up around fossil fuels and then we can't just sort of you know, pull people to to new uh, areas without really giving them the support and the training and, and, and the resources. And it's exactly the same in developing countries. It's talking about coal in South Africa, in, you know, Indonesia and, and so on and so forth. So we, we, we've got to be able to put the resources um, behind that. And uh, I think, you know, for adaptation and mitigation, I think the finance agenda um, has got to be the big the big focus for, for this year. And it will certainly be certainly a very big focus for us so um that's probably more than 10 minutes i, I forgot to look at my watch but um but uh yeah delighted uh delighted to have catherine here i mean maybe just to, to, to finish off uh by saying that you know we have a great deal in common also in we, we share a world bank constituency maybe everybody may not be aware of that but not only do we share a world bank constituency between ireland and canada but we also have a bunch of small island states so there's a very interesting within the finance conversation that we're both very involved in. There's a whole area about reforming of the multilateral development banks and so on, where I think we have access to really great sort of frontline perspectives from from the Caribbean SIDS. Uh, and I think uh, an, another another reason why we we, we can do uh, more together on, on, on the finance agenda. Thank you very much. Um, can I ask you just both briefly? On this point I touched on at the outset, you know, the big event is every year. And there was some discussion, certainly I picked up, and you see it in some of the media as well, and some of the countries that, and I think Al Gore, you know, the, 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 I mean, we all, we're all aware, and you, you more than any, aware of the difficulty of obtaining agreement from whatever, 198 countries. Um, as a big diplomatic effort, uh, concentrated in a short period of days, as it necessarily must, yeah. in terms of people's availability. Um, I'm just wondering, though, about the balance between the necessity to have the big event and then the, the process that continues right, continues right through the year in any event. Mm. And whether there isn't, in some people's minds anyway, a case for maybe taking the focus off the annual event and try to get the world to see 
more and more, as I'm sure more and more people do and countries do, that this is an ongoing process. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's a it's a great question. And um, certainly for the people who organize logistics in Canada, they they ask that question quite a bit because it, <laughs> yeah. it does take uh, it does take a lot of people to um, coordinate uh, all the different pieces required of a cop. Um, but the 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 value of having a big climate event every year is that it it gives countries, it gives people something to focus on, something to push toward. And uh, you know, I know within Canada, there's always a lot of thought about how can we position ourselves this year? What ambition, what what things can we be moving forward? Um, you you have good conversations with with like-minded countries, but other countries about what what is required this year? You know, the climate mm. finance is a big one, but looking at loss and damage last year uh, to say, you know, if we actually do land this fund, we're going to need funds to set it up. So so you think internally about how are we going to support that if we do end up with that decision? So it really does help to to center um, activity and action toward, you know, a big event. Mm -hmm. And it also gives that opportunity for others, for stakeholders to hold your feet to the fire mm -hmm. and, and to put pressure on other countries, um, to do more. So I think mm -hmm. as, as, as expensive as it, as it is, and as big as these are getting, and we can talk about whether they need to be as big, um, it nevertheless still helps to um, to really focus countries and focus people on the urgency. Mm. So I, I do see a lot of value with having these sure. every year. Sinead? Yeah, um, I, I, I mean, one thing is we may be forced to have a smaller cop because apparently there's only 25,000 20, hotel rooms in Baku. So right. we're all wondering, you know, there was almost 100,000 people in, 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 uh, in Dubai. Mm. Um, so, 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 but, but I would certainly agree, and I think domestically as well, the media hook mm. of COP in 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 uh, in our country, and I'm sure in in yours, I think is 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 very helpful. Um, I mean, I think t t two other things on that. I mean, COP, yes, it's about the negotiation, but actually, most of those people are not coming for the negotiation of the global stock take text, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually a really small minority of us. Mm. Most people are coming for side events, they're mm. coming for declarations, they're coming for launch of this initiative, that initiative, and so on. Mm. I mean, I definitely think there's an argument, you know, in terms of, of has, it, has it become kind of mm. too too big and too bloated, but but I would agree with Catherine that it, it, it does provide a useful um, mm. kind of a marker in the year. I can tell you, we'd never have agreed on loss and damage if we didn't have a deadline. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that we would still be discussing in the transitional committee. Um, but but I think your your question also um, uh, reminds me, Alex, of of another dimension of this, which is that, you know, so many other organizations and bodies need to feed, feed into the climate agenda. I mean, the COP is really a very technical forum. I mean, if you look at the GST text, you know, and you're not a climate person, you'd be kind of you'd be looking at it for some time, and you wouldn't <laughs> it wouldn't make a great deal of sense. Probably, you know, it's it's a lot more technical than, than people realize. But where where we need a lot of support and, and and Canada obviously is very key in this, the G7, the G20, the annual meetings of the World Bank, the IMF, like there's so many different fora, the IEA uh, in, in Paris, there's so many different fora that we need to implement some of the things that are sort of agreed as targets in, in COP. Mm -hmm. Climate finance is probably the area where that's most evident. You know, we can talk about uh, maritime levies and we can talk about all these things, but but the COP doesn't have the mandate to do those kinds of things. That needs ministers of finance and, and so on. So I think that what's also important is how we interface, you know, how the COP process mm. interfaces with, with a lot of these other sure. um, well, a lot of these other processes that do happen during the year. Sure. Just with advance apologies again, I, I unfortunately have to leave, but I was going to invite Ambassador Murray perhaps to to I think you were you, you might have a question for our guests or an observation. Ambassador and Morocco, that's... and if you'll excuse me, I'll I'll be gone by the time you finish your question. I do apologize. So thank you, Excellencies, for your uh, valuable insight on climate change. Globally, the incremental nature of efforts to combat it, especially in vulnerable regions, remains a challenge. Morocco, a country significantly impacted by the climate change, has demonstrated a steadfast 
commit with sustainable energies, green hydrogen, and global market integration. With an ambitious target of deriving 52% of its electricity from renewables by 2030, Morocco has successfully implemented concentrated solar power plants and wind farms nationwide. In collaboration with the EU and UK, Morocco strategically plans to export clean energy and green hydrogen. In the African context, Morocco takes the lead in regional initiatives focusing on agricultural adaptation, sustainability, and empowering young African climate leaders. Despite these commendable efforts, the momentum of Africa's climate action is hindered by limited involvement and funding. My question is, are there any specific actions undertaken or to be undertaken by Canada and Ireland to help to address climate change in Africa? Thank you. Sure. Yeah. And thank you for your question. And um, I just wanted to acknowledge the, the fact that you hosted COP 22nd right after Paris and, and congratulate you on that. That was my first COP, my first experience uh, in that in that big UN setting in, in Marrakesh, uh, which was which was really well done. And and it um, it really served to highlight Africa and the challenges in, in Africa as well. So thank you for, for your question. And for Canada, this is why climate finance is, is absolutely critical. And we um, doubled our climate finance a few years ago to 5.3 billion over five years and, and with an emphasis on mitigation, but adaptation, we increased our percentage to 40% adaptation um, because we do recognize that countries in Africa, especially, most vulnerable countries need more support on adaptation and need more grant financing too. We've, we heard that very loud and clear. So with our next replenishment um, under the 5.3, we increased our grant portion also from 30% to 40% because we're, we're listening to, um, to the needs that are out there and trying to be responsive. And um, we, we channel a lot of our climate financing through multilateral development banks. And I think that's why the conversation um, that we were just having, Sinead mentioned the work that we can do together to reform the banks so that more of what they are doing is focused on climate solutions at the same time as, as the other important work that they're doing is absolutely critical. And we've, we are also um, supporting access to financing, um, which we know there have been a lot of issues with in, in African countries as well. At COP28, um, I was highlighting the Climate Finance Access Network, uh, and it's a group of specialty advisors that are implanted in countries that need to build capacity on how to access climate finance. It's a very complex web um, and lots of, of forms, and, and, and we know it's difficult. So um, that's a project that we we're very pleased to continue to support um, to address those specific needs. We're looking forward to uh, our next climate finance replenishment and, and learning lessons again from this current um, uh, support about how we can be better at this. Um, MDB reform is a big part of it, increasing access to finance, increasing adaptation finance. Um, so we're looking forward to uh, having conversations uh, about our current finance allotment and how we can improve with the next um, finance allotment coming forward. So it's something that's very much at the front of our minds this year. Um, and as Sinead was saying, it's going to be a key uh, topic of conversation at COP29 as we look at this new collective quantified goal as well. Thank you, Master. Dr. Walsh. Yeah, I, I, won't... I won't repeat because a lot of, a lot of uh, my answer would be the same, actually. I mean, most of our climate finance uh, from Ireland is, is already going to Africa. It's, I, I think you know very well, Ambassador, it's our main kind of, um, uh, you know, area of, of engagement and, and uh, most of our climate finance, uh, about, about 80 percent uh, already targets adaptation. The, the only little bit I will add is that uh, I went to the Africa Climate Summit in, in Nairobi uh, uh, to accompany uh, Minister Ryan, um, and it was really, really good. It was really good. 
Um, it was good because this was back in, in the beginning of September. It was good because it really, it really demonstrated the African ownership of this issue. It was not, you know, even though climate finance, you know, uh, in terms of, of, of grand finance and so on was discussed, it really wasn't the main point. The main point was, you know, Africa is, is open for business, is already working on the green transition and, you know, really kind of focusing on private sector investment, actually, you know, sort of fair private sector investment, not the crazy, uh, you know, with the, with the sort of crazy interest rates that we have at the moment where Africa is totally penalized, as as you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the same people doing the same kind of, say, a solar project in, in you know, Ireland or, or Canada or the Netherlands or something like that. And um, so it was really focusing on, you know, African leadership, very strong leadership by by Kenya. Um, and I think I think it it kind of changed the conversation uh, in in a really welcome way. So I think we're we're keen to to continue to you know to support that African led agenda, and um, as well as as kind of continuing you know the support we give on on adaptation in particular. Thanks so much, Dr. Walsh, and thank you, Ambassador. And it's always good to have you here. Are there other questions here before me in the audience? I see one. Is there anything else? So two, Fergo. So I'll start with the gentleman here. I'm sorry, the gentleman here and then yourself. I'll come back to you in the second round, Fergo. Um, sorry, speakers, are you happy to take two questions at a go just to get through? Sure. So yourself first, then I'll hand over to the lady in front of you. Uh, thank you very much. This is a question for Ambassador Stewart. What can Canada's provincial governments do to help meet the nation's climate goals? Thank you. Excellent. You also just, you know, the speaker, you just might identify yourself. My name is Patrick. Thanks, Patrick. Good to have you here. And then the lady in front here, Kian, please, um, in the orange jumper. Hi, thank you. Uh, Gemma O'Reilly with NESC, the National Economic and Social Council. Um, just with the, um, I guess with my optimistic hat on, the good outcome on uh, fossil fuels in the last COP, I was just wondering about, you, you know, I, I suppose strategies for turning that, you, you know, from nice words and uh, on a piece of paper into something actionable, whether that would be, I, I guess, incorporated in a more, I guess, process uh, kind of way into the global stock taking future in terms of measuring outcomes, in terms of even the loopholes, seeing are the loopholes being implemented properly. Um, a lot of ambiguity around the potential for CCS, I, I suppose. Um, even I, I wonder about the role of the IPCC to clarify what is the potential of the loopholes or what isn't? Um, and then if if I may, yeah, a little like. mini uh, second question, um, the area of capacity building, um, you, you know, we talk about mitigation cop, adaptation cop, um, okay. you know, loss and damage cop. Um, but, you, you know, capacity building is always the poor child, if you like. Um, and I just wonder, um, you know, especially when you talk about climate finance, private climate finance. I mean, you, you know, we struggle ourselves, you, you know, with engaging private finance and the idea that we would expect, you know, developing countries to go from zero to 100, you, you know, in this area, when actually it's a journey we all need to be on. And there's a lot of capacity building, very in-depth and broad capacity building required there. I think it could do a bit more focus. Thanks, William Gemma, and it's great to have, have Nesk here. We don't get enough questions about regional provincial government in Canada, so let's start with that from, from Patrick. We'll start with Ambassador Stewart. Yeah, thank great you question. for that. Yeah, I mean, for Canada, um, we very much need to be collaborating, cooperating with our, provin our provinces in order to address climate change. So um, the yeah. first uh, pan-Canadian framework, which was introduced in 2016, was the result of uh, almost a year of in-depth discussions and um, collaboration with our provinces, territories, and indigenous communities so that we had a approach, a climate plan, an approach to climate which, which had maximum buy-in. Um, because in Canada, we have different jurisdictional responsibilities mm -hmm. and we all need to be in on this in order to be able to tackle climate change. And a lot of provinces do have net zero targets in place by 2050. A lot of them have their, their own planning. But as you can appreciate, um, we have lots of good ongoing dialogue about our approach on climate change. 
We have net zero um, by 2050 in our legislation in Canada. So um, it's, it is a law to reach a net zero by 2050. We also um, must put together a climate plan for Canada and that involves consultation um, with stakeholders, but with provinces and territories so that we can develop a plan um, that we can all work together toward. Not easy. Um, uh, we have lots of 100, over 140 different measures that we are implementing together um, with, with provinces and territories and, and communities. And it's a constant, uh, it's a constant work in progress. Um, that's the reality in, in Canada. Um, and we've got some good success stories on our work towards zero emission uh, vehicles that uh, all sales of zero, zero emission vehicles by um, 2030 will be zero emission vehicles, 100%. And we also are working on clean electricity reg regulations. Right now, Canada is 85%, all 85% of our energy comes from clean energy. And we're moving to 100% by 2035. We can't do that without cooperation and collaboration with the provinces, mm. given the jurisdictional issues there. Um, and then we have carbon pricing regime in Canada as well, which uh, the provinces, many provinces have their own system of carbon pricing. Where they don't, the federal government comes in mm. and has imposed its own system, which includes a federal surcharge on fossil fuels and also an output output based pricing system. So it's a little complicated, but all to say we have a we have a carbon pricing system which applies across our country, gives flexibility to provinces to implement a pricing system that works for them. And where they ask for the federal to cover government to come in or where they don't have a system, the federal government comes in. So lots of things I more more I could talk about there, but just gives you a little bit of a sense mm -hmm. of the work that we have to do within Canada um, to put together a climate plan. And, and work to uh, to get us to where we need to be. Do you want me to talk to the capacity building question? Keep yeah, going. You, <laughs> keep, going. keep going, yeah. I don't know if you'll have much to okay. say about, about provincial government um, agenda's questions. <laughs> yeah, so lots lots in your, your question there, but I think um, the capacity building one is certainly a focus of our fi climate finance. And I mentioned the climate finance access network as an example of building local capacity to be able to access climate finance. And we've also supported initiatives to build capacity within countries to be able to develop NDCs, their nationally determined contributions, their adaptation plans, um, because we recognize that some countries are much further behind than others and that there's that need to develop capacities within governments to be able to do what, what it is that they, they need to do. We also, as a bilingual nation, recognize the challenges of Francophone countries um, because a lot of the banks give their uh, instructions in English. And so I think for Anglophones, it's hard enough to try to understand and complete the, the, the requirements. But um, for countries, Francophone countries too, we recognize that there's a real capacity uh, limit there. So we do a lot of work with La Francophonie to, mm. to be able to, to help out there. Um, on the fossil fuel outcome, uh, you know, it, it, is, it is a very strong commitment to um, contribute to global efforts to transition away from fossil fuels in the energy sector. And Canada takes that very seriously. And in fact, we, we show a lot of leadership on how to do that. I mentioned carbon pricing. That's one way of putting a, a price on pollution. It is not free to pollute in Canada. And, uh, and that's one way that we are helping to drive down emissions by putting in place our clean electricity regulations, which I mentioned, 100% clean electricity by, by 2035. That's another way to encourage the drive down of emissions. We have tax incentives for carbon capture and storage in Canada. Um, and we also have uh, different different funds to support innovation, to support clean technology. So we like to um, show by doing, um, and because it's not an easy thing in Canada, the fossil fuel sector is a key part of our economy. We are a major emitter and we know we need to do more. And so it's hard work. It requires a lot of coordination and collaboration with our provinces with indigenous communities, um, but we like to talk about it because it's not easy. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be ambitious if it was easy. So uh, we take that commitment very seriously. We were very happy with that outcome uh, at, 
at COP28, and I think we we want to continue to demonstrate, um, including our coal phase out, we're phasing out coal for power by 2030 in Canada. So lots of things that we want to share and talk about, in addition to driving international initiatives to get us there too. And just quickly, mm -hmm. um, we uh, started up with the UK, the Powering Past Coal Alliance, and we now have over 185 members of that alliance committed to phasing out coal for power use at COP28, we were happy to see the U.S. sign on to that and the UAE. It's gaining momentum. So that's why I was disappointed. That why I said earlier I was disappointed we didn't see the phase out of coal because I think we've got huge momentum on that. But we're getting there. And I think we've started this international initiative, which helps give the visibility to that. We also started another international initiative called the Global Carbon Pricing Challenge. And again, it's encouraging other countries to, um, to, to demonstrate the impact and, uh, of, of carbon pricing as an effective policy tool, which drives down emissions, helps with affordability, and promotes innovation. So we're hoping that Ireland will, will want to join um, the Global Carbon Pricing Challenge. We, were, we are now with 11 partners. Um, it's a very new but, uh, initiative that Prime Minister Trudeau started at COP26, so we're we're looking for new members. But I think these these initiatives um, help to raise the visibility globally of some very valuable tools we can use that will help to drive down emissions. The view from Ireland, Sinead. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose j just on 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 that, it might be interesting um, for for people to know that we we joined the Climate Club at. At COP, um, and you might wonder what that is because it's kind of a vague enough, uh, <laughs> vague enough name. But it, it's 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 basically it it it's partly you know uh, kind of related, I suppose, to 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 carbon pricing, and it's an initiative to, I think, in, in it, kind of a, a sort of a German pushed G seven initiative, mm -hmm. maybe the, the the way to that that mm -hmm. it's it's it's, uh, it's come to us. But I suppose it's it's another one of these initiatives. How can um, you know, coming back to that non-negotiated part of COP that we talked about earlier, you know, how can a certain group of sort of first mover or champion countries, um, in this case, it's it's looking at kind of, you know, industrial decarbonization, you know, how can a certain number of sort of allies like raise the bar on on, on some of these kinds of issues and work together on standards and 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 you know push things forward maybe in hard to abate sectors and that kind of thing but i suppose that that's that's just sort of um uh an aside to say that i think you know we we, we also have a, a carbon price that that what we hold very very dear so so um I, I'm, I'm sure it'll be good to talk to you about that initiative um, but just on on Gemma's questions, I mean, I think uh, Gemma and, and knowing your background, I, I I know they're also kind of sneaky suggestions as well as questions. So I, I and I do actually agree with them. Um, you know, in in addition to to what uh, Catherine mentioned on, on capacity building, we we did also manage uh, at a COP to get agreement on the host of the Santiago Network for capacity building on loss and damage. So I think there is, yeah, there are, uh, and similarly we support, you know, the NEC partnership, the NAP Global Network for adaptation planning and, and, and things like that. So so totally agree in capacity building. I mean, if we look at our own country, as you say, Gemma, we see the enormous need for, you know, just a whole mindset shift and a whole shift of how we mm -hmm. how we do economy and society. This is nothing short of that. So so why should it be different and 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 uh, you know, for countries with vastly fewer resources, we need to help them out. And I think on the on the strategies, it's true. I mean, I'm not I'm not sure. Um, just on on like I'm not sure. For example, the mitigation work program it has been agreed now at at COP that that will will continue and have a couple of meetings this year. So whether they can um you know try to to do a little bit of what you're suggesting in terms of making some of those outcomes um, measurable. I'm, I'm not sure, but, but I, I, could, I, could, uh, I could ask around a bit uh, um, for you. But, but uh, maybe just one other point that, that you reminded me of there is, is on carbon capture and storage. We are gonna need a certain amount of carbon capture and storage. I mean, I know it has a, has a bad name and, and people were concerned that you know, UAE and maybe Azerbaijan were going to sort of you know, uh, have it as a sort of a silver bullet. The reality is we've let it, left it too late to not have a need for some carbon capture and storage. So, um, but, but it is just about making sure that it's restricted to the absolute, uh, you know, hardest to abate sectors. Otherwise it's just, as you know, um, incredibly, <laughs> incredibly uncost efficient. 
Um, yes. Thanks a million, Sinead. We're unfortunately against the clock. So there's a question here from Frogan McNamara and the gentleman next to you. If you could both be as, as brisk as you can in the questions. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, I'm Frogan McNamara and I co-chair the Climate and Energy Group here at the Institute. At another time in my life, I was uh, vice president of the Alberta electric system operator running the electric grid in Calgary. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that yeah. connection and the fondness I have for the uh, province, I follow the uh, Al Alberta Premier, who's been mm -hmm. making a lot of noise very recently, uh, raising the rhetoric and discussing uh, the climate change and the impact on the province. And I, I, uh, it's, it's sort of got to the level now where it's almost like the National Energy Programme of Trudeau Senior, mm -hmm. the sort of debate between the two. And I just wondered about your comments on that. Thank you. Thank you, Fergal. Hi, David Regan. I'm the Chief Executive of Concern. Concern is an NGO in Ireland, a large NGO. Um, first of all, congratulations to the speakers on the progress that was made in, in COP. As somebody working in the in the sector in Africa, it is usually heartening to see that support coming through. It really is is it is very good at a multilateral level. <laughs> but we also face a very stark reality. Have you seen? The situation in Somalia, in Kenya, in, 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 in Bangladesh, in Chad, it is, it's really, really worrying. People losing their livelihoods on a major scale. And as, as you suggested, Sinead, uh, essentially we're, we're radically insufficient response in terms of finance. Uh, and the question is, in terms of moving that forward, it feels like COP is never going to move fast enough because it's such a, such a universal uh, forum. Is there some other form of leadership where uh, greater moves could be made by a smaller subset of countries? And I'm aware of some political winds south of Canada, which aren't particularly positive. But you wonder, how do you pull together a group who really want to show leadership in, in this area at a time when the needs are dramatic and, uh, and quite frightening? Good to have you here as well. We'll privilege the ambassador again. So. Yeah, I, well, I'm glad somebody in the audience is following uh, politics so closely. <laughs> there is uh, uh, definitely um, a leader that in Alberta right now who's very much railing against uh, the efforts of the federal government. It's interesting for those of you who want to read about Canadian politics. It's an interesting read. Uh, I think it. I think it illustrates that um, none of this is easy. And when it comes to energy transition, you need to bring everybody along. And we, we've had this experience with coal phase out in Canada. We established a task force that went into the coal communities and spoke to the businesses, spoke to the workers, um, spoke to you know all of, all of the people around the industry that would be impacted by the phase out of coal to talk about a plan forward. And I think, um, you know, with with fossil fuels and and the the um, agreement that came out of COP on the transition away from fossil fuels, it's important to note that you know that needs to all happen in a just, orderly, and an equitable way. And I think Canada feels very strongly about bringing everybody along. And with the initiatives that we're introducing to to reduce emissions, we're not talking about reducing production. That's a provincial jurisdiction. We're talking about the federal government responsibility to, to reduce emissions. And so this is where the, 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 the political um, play out is, is happening right now. Um, but I would, I would just note that um, there's, a, there's actually a good ongoing dialogue that the federal government has with Alberta in moving forward on a lot of the initiatives that we that we've been putting forward, including reducing our uh, emissions on methane in the oil and gas sector by 75% by 2030. Um, the clean electricity regulations that have been introduced, there's also a good ongoing dialogue on that. So there's a political level um, play out for sure, as you've noted, but I think there's a lot um, that continues to happen in, in good cooperation and collaboration. Um, when it comes to your question about how can we work and do things faster, it's it's a great question because multilateralism can be very frustrating in terms of in terms of the pace. And I think this is where Canada looks to find partners. Um, you know, I, I look at the global methane pledge that the US and the EU started to give visibility of the value of reducing methane emissions and to push countries on, supporting developing countries in their efforts to reduce methane, 
but also um, sharing innovations, sharing best practices in agriculture sector and the land and waste sector, oil and gas sector on how we can drive down methane emissions. We don't have to wait for uh, the multilateral system to sort of you know, move that forward. Um, we can join initiatives to share these experiences. That's like the Powering Pass Coal Alliance I was mentioning, the Global Carbon Pricing Challenge. These are these are smaller initiatives where, you know, like-minded um, countries come together that support a policy that can share and move it forward. Under the G7 as well, we've done some work on the Global Shield um, to to also support early warning systems. So I think, uh, you know, there's a lot we can do in in different different fora. There's a lot we can do bilaterally as well with different cooperation initiatives with different countries. So there are other ways to um, to address issues in a more, uh, you know, faster, in a faster way. Thanks, Ambassador. Final words to you, Sinead. Yeah, I mean, I would just, David, I, I have nothing to say about Alberta, sorry, but <laughs> just, just David, on, on your question, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I, I completely agree. I mean, if you're waiting for cops to sort out finance, you can, you can forget about it. Uh, I do think that we have some good initiatives percolating. Um, you know, France had that very good, uh, you know, it wasn't just climate finance, but I think that's fair enough, right? Developing countries are dealing with with all sorts of development finance challenges uh, and, and climate finance is, is just a part of that. Um, but I think there was a very strong climate finance uh, and debt focus to the meeting that President Macron hosted in, in June. There's all the work of, of Mia Motley in Barbados. I mentioned uh, the Africa Climate Summit, uh, President Ruto. There's a new commission on kind of taxation and how, ta you know, how you can get some of these flows to support climate finance, a little bit like what we were talking about earlier with innovative sources. So very much as Catherine is saying, there are these sort of champion groups uh, of countries that are coming together I think on the climate finance side, you know, Ireland is 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 definitely um, we are, we sort of have the two feet in in there. I I I doubt you 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 need to be told that because every time Minister Ryan speaks, I'm I'm pretty sure uh, you hear him talking about about climate finance and and the need for this this scale up and and this multiplicity of of sources. So uh, I I expect this year, and I really hope this year we can get some momentum on that again using using the fact that COP29 is going to be very focused on, on, on climate finance, but not depending on COP29 to solve our problems on sources, but, but hopefully using it as a kind of a, a deadline uh, to, to move some of these other initiatives forward. I'd like to thank our speakers most sincerely. Unfortunately, we are at time. I, I do have a profound sense you've only scraped the surface. Uh, and there's a bunch of great questions, I'm afraid, just to Professor Alan Matthews and to Michael O'Brien and others online. We haven't had a chance to get to your questions, but I will pass those questions on to the speakers so that you have them. I think it's always fun to know what questions you inspire in people. If they're easy, we can email answers. <laughs> they're not easy, we won't. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> isn't, isn't that a lovely offer? I also <laughs> just want to say, obviously, a sincere welcome to Ambassador Thank Stewart, you. your first time in, in, in Ireland, so have a lovely time. But just want to kind of celebrate the great relations we have with our colleagues in the Canadian Embassy, Ambassador Smythe. Jackie Ellis and Dave Kafa, they're, they're great supporters of the Institute and it's just a real pleasure to renew our collaboration. So I hope we'll continue. Canada has to be one of the most Irish places outside of yeah, Ireland, right? Like we were yeah. saying. So <laughs> I hope we can continue to continue to work on solving problems together. So if you could just give a big boot of bus to the speakers. Mm -hmm.